Everyone understands the necessity and reason for paying child support, but when it comes to paying support to an ex-spouse, many people bitterly object, especially if they've already had to divide their property. Today on Family Matters, spousal support. Why does the law require some people to continue supporting their ex-partners after a breakup? In what situations would this occur? How is the amount of support calculated and how long should you be expected to support your ex? This compelling and controversial topic is the subject of today's program and will feature two lawyers and a judge. Our first guest is family law lawyer Lisa Eames. Lisa, thanks for being on the show. Thank you. I think we should start by explaining to people what is spousal support? Well, spousal support is financial support paid by one spouse to a former spouse in recognition of a number of different factors related to the, their marriage and marriage, their relationship, or their separation. So what are the most important factors that would, re that would require somebody to support their ex? We all understand why you have to yeah. support your children, but why in some circumstances do you need to support an ex-partner who may have betrayed you and hurt you, left you, cheated on you? Yeah. Well, I think it's important to note that I don't think blame has any place in spousal support. The courts don't want to look at bad behavior to determine whether or not spousal support is appropriate. I think the purpose of spousal support and the reason it ought to be paid in some circumstances is it recognizes economic advantages and disadvantages that spouse, one spouse may have had over the course of the marriage because of how the parties structured their relationship. As well, it recognizes the fact that upon separation, sometimes one spouse may be in such dire economic circumstances that really some support is required in order to bridge the separation process. And so many times people become financially dependent on the other partner. Absolutely. Their finances are intertwined throughout their relationship. So it's, I mean, I think it would be fundamentally unfair at the end of that relationship to simply pull a plug and say, too bad, so sad, you're on your own financially, when over the course of the past 10, 15, 20 years, that wasn't the case. But when we, uh, I, I know you're quite a bit younger than me, but when I was young, most marriages were very traditional kind of marriages. Mm -hmm. Many uh, moms were stay at home, primary caregivers to the children, and after 25 years, or maybe even 15 years, the marriage ends, mm -hmm. and mom, who has no uh, uh, marketable skills, needs to be supported. That's what we'd call the traditional marriage, exactly. right? Exactly. But today, you've got a lot of couples that where they both work. Why would one need to support the other in that circumstance? In any jurisdiction, there's going to be legislation in place that's going to determine when spousal support ought to be payable. So even though the parties may both work, I mean, one may have given up her, I say her, because that's traditionally what you know, in the past, um, it was the female obviously collecting spousal support from the male, but it might, it might be that even though they, both parties work, one may have relegated his or, relegated his or her educational opportunities, so perhaps that individual is working in, in a career or a vocation that um, is, maybe less, is less than... Um, remunerative than what it would have been if they were single. Exactly. Because, you know, I, I see that in court. I see lots of couples where one of them is working, but they've taken mm -hmm. a job that's maybe part-time mm -hmm. or less demanding so that they can be home and meet the needs of the family yes. more so than the other partner. Well, exactly. I and, mean, and, and if they were earning the same income level, then you would, the spousal support, you know, theoretically would be nil. But if there is a large discrepancy in the income earning potential of the two parties, that's where spousal support would be appropriate. And there's really no kind of relationship that is excluded from this, is there? I mean, it could be a man that applies for spousal support or mm -hmm. a woman. Absolutely. It could be a same-sex couple if you're living in a jurisdiction where same-sex relationships are uh, valid in terms of the law. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be married people or common law couples if you're living in a relationship where common law relationships uh, have those kind of rights. Right. 
But I think it's worth pointing out, isn't it, that if you're not married and it's a common law relationship, there may be a time limitation that you have to be together. Absolutely. In many jurisdictions, in the jurisdiction that where I live, there's a two-year period within which you have to have been living together in a marriage-like relationship in order to qualify for spousal support. So you can't date somebody for six months and then say, now I want you to support me forever. Absolutely not. And the jurisdiction where I live, it's three years. But the idea is that people need to help each other mm -hmm. after a relationship breaks up to get on their feet. Absolutely. Is that fair enough? I think that's fair, for sure. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean it's forever, though, does it? Well, it doesn't, but it's, there's no real clear-cut definitive endpoint in the legislation, I would say. So it really, I mean, there is some, op, there's some um, impetus on the other spouse to become economically self-sufficient to the extent that's practicable, but it, al it, it necessarily always isn't. So we look to the court, we look to different regulations and guidelines to g help guide us in the length and duration that spousal support should be paid. You know, many people will say, I mean, you must have had clients that say to you, look, uh, why doesn't he or she get a job? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, they've got an obligation to support themselves. And I think a lot of it depends on how old they are, how their health is, mm -hmm. what their skills are. Mm -hmm. But isn't it fair to say that some people, you know, do, there is an obligation to go back to school, mm -hmm. upgrade mm -hmm. your education, get training in something. Mm -hmm. Well, there is an obligation to attempt, as I said, to become self-supporting and absolutely the individual who is collecting spousal support, as you can't sort of rest on that, um, on that support indefinitely. So it's not a pension for life. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a break. I want to thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you. When we come back, we will talk with lawyer Jonathan Lazar. Don't go away. Welcome back to our discussion of spousal support. I'm pleased to welcome our next guest, family law lawyer Jonathan Lazar. Welcome to the show, Jonathan. Thank you for having me. What are the factors that are taken into account in determining if someone is entitled to spousal support? Well, there are many factors. Uh, you look at the age of the parties, the uh, economic uh, disadvantages or advantages one spouse may have had through the marriage, the roles that those parties took on in the marriage. Do you think that some partnerships, some relationships take on roles that they didn't initially intend? Absolutely. And I think, you know, people get married, they don't know where their lives will take them. And you can have roles where people might have not planned on having children and they did. And then maybe one spouse does stay home with children for a lengthy period of time, giving up career opportunities and other economic opportunities. And that's sort of when spousal support can start uh, being a big factor in their breakup. It's a very emotional part of family law, isn't it? It is very much emotional. Uh, many spouses some pay, pay people who are expected to pay, they don't want to. Or they have a different view on what the other person may have given up in a career. They may have de debates over the person going back to work quicker than the other spouse may want to go back to work. I always find it interesting when uh, a person will say to me in court, someone who against whom there's a claim for spousal mm -hmm. support, and they'll say to me, I was trying to get him or her to get a job for years. <laughs> I never agreed that they should stay home. You know, the kids are in school all day. Yeah. Why do I have to support them? But mind you, 15 years went by. That's a great point. And, and it really is a common, uh, I think, depending on which client I'm meeting with, that's a common uh, discussion. One is the one who doesn't see why they should be paying. And the other one is the one who said, well, wait a sec, I did stay home with the children. And I was there after school, or I took them to the doctor's appointments. So sometimes people's views of the roles they had in the marriage seem to change as they separate. <laughs> they seem to sometimes forget what roles they had. And as you said, if time goes on, and time is one of those factors, the length of a relationship is a very important factor in, in whether you're going to support someone post-separation and divorce or, or not. Now what about how you calculate the amount that you owe? Well, they now have in most jurisdictions uh, guidelines or calculators that help uh, give an estimate or a range of what the spousal support could be. And, but it does look at basic factors, the age of the parties, the years they're together, and the incomes that those parties may have or incomes that may they, they may be able to achieve. But the guidelines have helped narrow down some of that debate, but it still leaves open some debate. But So it, it's like a software. Correct. In, in Canada, it's mysupportcalculator.ca, and correct. it's free, correct? Correct. Yep. And a person can punch in 
the number, the numbers you've just mentioned, yep. the ages of the parties when they separated, how long they were together, how many children, how old they are. Mm -hmm. And I guess we should mention that that's important because child support always comes first, doesn't Correct. it? Correct. You don't get to spousal support until there's enough money first to support the children. Absolutely. Child support's always a priority. And those support calculators are very good. I still think some caution is available for people to not interpret it directly. Don't look at a number on a computer printout and think that's an absolute uncertainty. They should still get some guidance and get some advice and help get, get a range of possible solutions and a range of possible options that they have when it comes to spousal support. And you're right, it is an after the fact, uh, after child support, after some other factors are taken into account, then we see what spousal support should and shouldn't be paid. So you should never just run with that number that you've found from mysupportcalculator.ca, you should go to a lawyer. Correct. I think it's a good. It's it's great for people to go online and get information, and that's mysupportcalculator.ca would be a good place to start. But getting someone to help interpret those results, or at least to help them understand there's different factors that a computer program may not understand again who stayed home with the children or who did what that that you can't really put into a computer program it's much more difficult are you seeing in recent years more men applying for spousal support than we used to see certainly certainly because i see a number of stay at home dads mm -hmm. uh, it's the wife that has the bigger income they've made a decision as a couple mm -hmm. that she's going to be out there uh, being the breadwinner Sure. And he's going to stay home and be the stay-at-home dad and give up his career. It is definitely more common. I think the traditional relationship we would have thought of 30 years ago, for example, when my parents would have got together, there was a stay-at-home mom and a, and, a, and a dad who worked, and relationships are much more different now. And people make those very good economic decisions. You may have the female spouse who has the better paying job or maybe more benefits or, or health care benefits through a job, or the male spouse doesn't, or they just make that decision on their own. You know what? This is best for our family. We want to have someone home, and they decide it's the, the husband or the, the father, and that happens very often, and it's happening more and more in my practice. I see that as well. And it's important to point out that the way that the support will be calculated is no different, whether Correct. it's a man applying or a woman. Correct. And uh, do you think that spousal support ultimately is one of these areas that might eventually uh, become easier for people to accept now that we have more and more couples where both parties work? Uh, it'll not only become easier to accept, but I think you'll have less and less need for it. If you have two spouses who essentially have been in the workforce with similar incomes over a period of time, there's going to be less fact that spousal support might not even come into play. There's so another thing too though, in the remaining moments I just want to mm -hmm. ask you, I see a lot of breakups happening very early in relationships. Yeah. People that met online, they didn't know each other very well, they were together maybe a year, maybe two, yeah. uh, and they break up. If you're young and you are only together a very short time, whether or not you had a child, although I think the child matters Correct. a lot, uh, you shouldn't really expect spousal support to go on very long, should you? You, it might not go on at all, and if it does, it wouldn't be for very long. And that's, again, part of those factors we talked about at the beginning. The age of the parties, the length of the relationship, and did one of them give up some form of economic uh, consequence or, or benefit from the marriage? In even short, if it was a short relationship? Even if it was a short relationship. What if they've remarried? Is it possible to get spousal support from an ex even though you found a new partner? Uh, that may depend legislatively in different jurisdictions, and it may depend on, on what their arrangements are. It's probably possible, but it's something maybe these people should check out individually in their own jurisdiction. So it depends on the individual case. Correct. Thank you very much for being here, Jonathan. You're very welcome. When we come back after the break, we will be hearing from a family court judge in Chambers. Don't go away. In chambers with me now is Justice Stanley Scher, a very senior and experienced family court judge, talking about spousal support. Why is spousal support considered to be such a complicated and difficult and challenging part of family law? Well, spousal support cases are really emotionally charged. We find in court that often we can settle the custody, the access, the child support, and the last issue standing is spousal support. And when you think about it, it's really understandable. People go through a whole array of emotions when they separate. And two of the dominant emotions that we face every day are fear and anger. People are afraid. What is my life going to look like? 
Am I going to be able to support myself? Am I going to be able to have the same lifestyle that I had before? And that translates into anger. There's anger at the person who's put them into that very scary place. And isn't there also a feeling of, of betrayal? I mean, many, many relationships break up because of infidelity, uh, some form of disappointment, and um, the sense that you have to support someone who may have hurt you. And what we see happening then is that there's a tendency to diminish the role of the other person in the relationship. So what you'll see is that the payor parent will be uh, filing affidavits, diminishing the worth of the other parent. They'll say that they uh, don't really help out in the relationship, that they uh, sit on the couch all day uh, watching reruns of Family Matters, not helping uh, with the family at all, and I shouldn't have to pay support for that person. And then the other parent goes on the counterattack, and they say, well, I'm the one who's responsible for all your success. You'd be nothing without me. And uh, by the way, the kids hate you as well. So that's what happens. And yet, I think that uh, somehow that what gets lost in all of that is that people need to know that in most jurisdictions, and I must say that the law is different in all jurisdictions, but we're talking generally here in North America, your conduct throughout the relationship, whoever hurt who, whatever the reason was for the breakup, is really irrelevant when it comes to spousal support, isn't it? For the most part. Except in the most exceptional of circumstances, conduct is relevant in these cases, and it's really an analysis of many other factors. Those factors have to do with the length of the relationship, the roles that each person played in the relationship, uh, the age, the health of the parties. There's numerous factors that go into a calculation for spousal support. I try to tell parents, spouses, ex-spouses, that they should think of their relationship as a, an economic partnership. It wasn't just a romantic relationship, it was economic. And that when it breaks up, you have to look at what those consequences were because usually in a spousal support case, am I right? So, someone was supporting someone else, and now that they've broken up, the person that was being supported still needs some financial assistance so that they can get themselves back on their feet. Exactly. There's an economic dependence that grows within that relationship, and people become vulnerable. And the basic principle of spousal support is to uh, recognize the roles that each person played in the relationship and to uh, compensate people for that role and also to protect people who've become vulnerable within that relationship. So what do you say to, the, to a, a person who's been asked to pay spousal support when they say to you, well, you know, why doesn't she or he get a job? And we should point out, spousal support, can, a claim can be made against a husband or a wife. It's not anything to do with gender, correct? It has nothing to do with gender at all. So what, what do you say when they say, you know, uh, the kids are in school now, uh, why can't she get a job? Why can't she support herself or he? Well, it's a legitimate argument and one of the very basic principles of spousal support is that everybody has uh, a responsibility to do their best to become self-supporting. That is a basic principle of spousal support law. If they can, I guess. If they can. It has to be looked at in context. So if you have a 60-year-old person who has been out of the workforce for 30 years, mm -hmm. realistically, they're not going to be able to become self-sufficient. That's far different than a 28-year-old person with no children uh, who uh, worked throughout the relationship or, and, and just uh, took a few months off. That person can become self-sufficient very quickly. And in fact, in that situation, there might not even be an entitlement to spousal support. I don't know if you agree with me, but lately, the last few years, I've been seeing a lot of cases where someone sponsors someone else to this country and marries them. The relationship breaks down fairly quickly. There might be a child, there might not. And the person is then uh, asked for spousal support. There's a claim. And they say, well, she or he married me just to get into this country and never loved me. And this was not even, uh, this was, I've been defrauded. I'm the victim here. Why should I have to support this person who, by the way, doesn't speak English, has no marketable skills in this country, and needs a long time to be able to acclimatize themselves to this culture and, and, and to the marketplace? Well, that's where your deep sense of betrayal comes in, where you see deep anger. And what we tell the people in that situation is that we have to look at all the circumstances, the, the circumstances that you just talked about. Well, the fact that they sponsored a person, yes, the, to me, that's very relevant. You know, if you've undertaken to the government, 
to the immigration authorities that you're going to support this person and you're going to be their spouse, uh, there's an obligation there to, to, to follow through with that obligation. Well, there's there? a contractual relationship there, and that's one, and again, another one of the uh, basis for child support is a contractual relationship. Now, and we have very, very little time left, so I want to get to the issue of separation agreements. Many people enter into separation agreements. I think it's really important to, to hear from a real judge about what you need to know if you're going to try and do this yourself. Should you ever? Never do it yourself. And if there's one message that I want to pass on here is get a lawyer. This is really, really complicated stuff. There's a lot of elements that go into a calculation of spousal support or even if you're entitled to spousal support. And what I often tell people is if you were doing a root canal, you wouldn't uh, do it yourself. Now, that said, I said that to somebody in court recently and that person said I would do my own root canal. And uh, that certainly told me something about that person, or at least the state of their dental health. Exactly. It seems to me, though, that uh, we've got to consider that people need to know that you've got to disclose all of your income, all of your assets. You can't hide stuff because that agreement won't be worth the paper it's written on, correct? A very important message to give is that you have to give full financial disclosure, otherwise that agreement is at real risk of not being held up. You have to play fair with the separation agreements. Important words from a very important judge. Justice Sher, thank you so much for being on our show. Thank you for having me. Hi, I'm Lauren McLean. Today on Q&A, our question is, I was only married for one year and I have sole custody of a nine-month-old child. Am I entitled to spousal support? Yes, you are. And you'll receive spousal support until at least your child's in full-time attendance at school, and likely even longer. Your total child support and spousal support received will be over half of both of the spouse's take-home pay. Young parents often have limited schooling, training, and work experience. Raising a child in an intact family is likely life's most demanding task, and being a single parent is unrelenting hard work. Spousal support is paid when there's need, and also where there's a greater economic loss to one of the spouses. The economic disadvantage to a younger spouse lies all ahead of them as a result of their child raising responsibilities that delay or prevent the development of their career. See a lawyer immediately if you've separated after a short marriage involving children. Thanks for watching. For extended interviews and exclusive content, please visit our website at familymatterstv.com. If you'd like to submit your legal question to our Q&A, go to advicescene.com. I'm Justice Harvey Brownstone. See you next time.